welcome to the Face of Pro-Life. Today I'm speaking with Friar Gabriel Cortez um, from the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate. Thank you so much for joining us today, Friar Gabriel. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess one of the first questions I'd like to ask you is, how did you become a friar? I know you grew up in New Hampshire, but how did you end up being here in our studio, Justin? Uh, well, yeah, it's been a, it is, it's an interesting uh, story. Everybody's story is an interesting story. Everybody has their own journey, their own path they've trod um, in coming either back to the faith or kind of, um, is, you know, starting to practice faith again uh, after having uh, set it aside. Um, to kind of sum it up within, you know, the amount of time that we have, basically, you know, being born into a Catholic family, all of... Um, my brothers and my one sister, she's the eldest, we all, you know, respected the faith. Mm -hmm. We all, um, you know, respected our parents, um, um, you know, you know, we respected w what um, they taught us, to, you know, even though as time went on, we didn't, you know, we didn't take it all that seriously, at least um, on a practical level mm -hmm. in our, in our, as far as our lifestyles went. Um, growing up in New Hampshire, so uh, but we all at least we all had a sense of the sacred. We would never, uh, we never, I never ever heard uh, my brothers or my sister or my parents, of course, much less, of course, uh, take God's name in vain. For mm -hmm. example, um, some of our friends would do that, and we would actually have the presence of mind and the grace, really, to actually correct that in them. If they're over our house, you know, we would be very um, conscious of, you know. Maintaining, a, you know, a, at least a minimal respect for that which was sacred, even though our lifestyles, as time went on, as we got older, was was a bit um, contradictory to our faith. Right. Nobody's perfect. No, no one's perfect. <laughs> so, so we basically, uh, my, uh, to kind of make a long story short, my dad actually got a transfer uh, in his work from New Hampshire to Virginia Beach. Wow. Virginia, and uh, so uh, you know, we were kind of as young, you know. Young American boys. Um, my my sister at this time she's already married and she's you know, um, you know living her life so she didn't move down with us of course. Um, but we were you know the boys are rubbing, rubbing their hands together. Oh this is going to be you know this is going to be wonderful. It's a little bit warmer down here. Sure. And all of us had uh, well, three of us. My eldest brother Dan, my uh, brother who's closest to me in age, who's now a friar, Friar Didicus, um uh, who is the technical director here, um, uh, and myself, we were kind of, t we took skateboarding very seriously. My brother, London, who's in the right there in the middle, um, he was doing his own thing. And But the three of us took skateboarding very seriously. We moved down to Virginia, Virginia Beach, and we all got a job down there and continued to skate and actually rode for a shop down there. I don't know if it's still um, there, but it, it was called Ultralight Surf and Skate. So we rode for them. Really? Like professionally? Yeah. Well, not professionally. We just, we rode for them. Um, it's not a major company. Um, but they sponsored you. But they sponsored us, and we did demos and stuff. And actually, my bro eldest brother, Dan, who also skated, uh, would, you know, he, his band would play for the demos. Oh, wow. And so we had a good old time down there. We were enjoying ourselves wholeheartedly uh, there in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Well, there's, a, there's a famous uh, um, American uh, professional skateboarder by the name of Mike Vallely. He's mm -hmm. from Virginia Beach. And uh, a, a guy we used to know, uh, Sergi Ventura, he, we, he used to work down there in the Virginia Beach w w when we lived there. And I have just found out not too long ago that he's, uh, he's now pro. So I was just like, oh, that's interesting. But um, so, you know, life was, uh, you know, kind of all one, you know, um, a, a bowl of cherries, you might say, um, as far as the, you know, as far as, far as the world is concerned. Sure. Um, and so, but um, I, we got enrolled in a school system down there, and um, that didn't actually go go down too well. Um, really? New Hampshire is a different kind of setting, um, Anglo Anglo-Saxon, you know, very um, very preppy, you know, type of. And we grew up there, so it was we were used to it. Right. And going down to Virginia Beach, it's um, different. Completely uh, ethnically is very uh, quite uh, more diverse. More diverse, you know, and so. Um, there was a different experience down there, and I didn't actually didn't take to the to this. I didn't take to the um, um, being enrolled in the school system down there. I kind of had a bit of a sh had a little bit of a shock down there, and I kind of went, had a little bit of a um, turbulent enrollment there in the school, which was a bit of a it kind of it was a bit of a humbling, mm -hmm. you know. And I, 
That's it. But that you know that didn't. Um, even though I did have re in my problems down there, um, I didn't. I had recourse to prayer because mm -hmm. I was going through a bit of a hard time. Um, it's always hard when you have to move, like when you're young, like that. Yeah, I was 15 at the time. Oh, that's a culture shock. <laughs> and it's a little bit, yeah. And I mean, we were, we were planning on having a good time, and we did have a good time. And then to some of the, you know the experiences of you know um, as a teenager, you get you experience different things and. Um, and my brothers and I were doing our own thing, and um, but that still didn't. Even though my problems were, you know, were, you know, we all have our own little painful experiences, that still didn't kick off the conversion, uh, because our lifestyles were all of us. I, um, I can I can um, safely say that all of our lifestyles were very um, opposed in, um, uh, to the to the teachings of the church. You know, you know. Our, Private lives were a bit unfortunate, um, but you know um, what happened was um, it was funny. Actually, God has a sense of humor. Oh, oh um, definitely, a, a divine sense of humor. And um, what happened was my brother, Friar Didicus, um, he actually needed a car to get back and forth to work. We had moved inland. We all had a job there at the at the beachfront. We're all working for. It seemed like all the Jews and Palestinians owned all the shops down there. <laughs> I was working for a Lebanese Catholic gentleman. Also, for at the same time, I was working for a, Pal uh, a Palestinian gentleman by the name of David Perez, and uh, and he, was, my brother Friar Didicus, was working for a Jew, and uh, there was some mutual. It was quite interesting the relationship they had because uh, my brother uh, Friar Didicus he actually asked for Sunday off, yeah. and this his Jewish boss said, "Okay, I understand because I take the Sabbath Saturday off." Right. Yeah, so he's he leaves Friday night to observe the Saturday. Yeah, so there's a mutual understanding there. But um, so what happened was um, he actually, once we moved inland, he needed a car to get to work. And so he actually had the presence of mind. I think he might have been, um, he can correct me if I'm wrong after the, uh, after the interview, <laughs> but I think it was at the behest of my mother, because she was always a very devout, staunch Catholic, uh, to pray a novena to obtain, you know, what he the needed. The means, right. The means, you know, because God knows our needs, as he said in the gospel, even before we ask him, not only spiritual but temporal needs as well. So but he, he still wants to hear you ask. <laughs> oh, he de definitely. And so that's why my mother uh, <laughs> encouraged him, I think, was um, to, to pray a novena to obtain a car to get back and forth to work. So uh, very shortly, but the, the deal was, if he obtained the, the, the vehicle, then he would assign himself to an hour of adoration uh, each week, uh -huh. which my mother, my mother was going to each night. She's, you know, she's a diehard you know, Roman Catholic you know, adoration church and everything else in the rosary. She would very often, as you know, as uh, as in our adolescence, you know, she would round us up like wild steed. You know, we were still in New Hampshire <laughs> to pray the rosary. As as reluctant as we were to do so, we still complied. Right. Because so long as you're a minor, you're going to pray the rosary in this house. So we had to we had to comply, um, even though it was a bit involuntary. Um, so we knew how to, you know, we knew what the what was um, what expected. Our what, what our mother expected <laughs> of us. So um, so yeah, he prayed this novena. Um, and I think actually they, my mom and he both fasted as well. And uh, this I didn't I had no idea. I, I just found this out afterwards, you know, after the fact. And so he obtained a car very quickly, you know. He just, wow. He was actually he was a nineteen. I could tell my kids about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> please do. It was a, it, not, it was it wasn't just any car. It was a nineteen seventy Cadillac Coupe de Ville in, in mint condition. And he put tassels around it, and <laughs> new upholstery, and made it a low rider. Because in the early 90s, you know, the low riders were in style. Oh, and we were, we were Hispanic, so, so we thought we were really cool <laughs> driving down the road, you know, with, our, with playing Santana blaring out of the windows. You know? cool. so, uh, so he obtained his car, and so he, he, had, he had enough, you know, he was very responsible growing up. He's the one who was, he was recognized by, you know, my parents as very responsible. We were, the rest of us were kind of a bit, you know, um, all over the place, but <laughs> he actually he he understood that he needed to fulfill his end of the bargain. Right, right. So he assigned himself to an hour of adoration at the ad, at the adoration chapel that was newly started uh, in uh, just uh, outside of Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach in the Norfolk, Virginia, where there's the largest naval base in America, um, just off of, just near the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so. There he was going to adoration, you know, fulfilling, you know, his promise to God that he would do this, and to Our Lady, and um, 
Um, and I hope, I'm sure you won't mind me saying this, but he was still living his double life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> still being a good old... Uh, uh, regular the, teenage the, the, kid. The girl, regular teenager, <laughs> and uh, also, you know, writing, <clears throat> writing in style, you know. Um, so what happened was he actually he actually asked me one day. He goes, you know, we were, it was just he and I. I don't I don't I don't know why it was just he and I in the house. It was the house, the house was empty except he and I. He was uh, getting himself ready to go to go to adoration, and I was sitting there between uh, between the kitchen and the living room, and he just he said, "Do you want to go with me?" And um, even though I was going, I was in, like, I was going through some, still some residual pain from, you know, the moon and everything. The, yeah, you know, my other little, you know, youthful pains and stuff. Um, and he goes, "Do you want to go with me?" And I was just like, in my mind, I was just like, "No," you know, <laughs> but I didn't say that. And so I just, I, I remember, I remember the day. I don't know what day it was. I mean, I, w I wish I knew. It was probably the feast of the Immaculate Conception, or Christ the King, or, or Resurrection Sunday. Something Who knows? really important. Something really important because I actually. Uh, acceded to his request and I yielded to, you know. So you picture you two boys driving down the street and this. Yeah, well, that was the that was the that, the that was the powerful church. incentive, you know, because he, he was he's just like you want to go. I was like no, I mean I didn't I didn't I didn't verbalize that, but in my mind I was like not really. But I I, I remember just a pause, uh, a very um, you know decisive pause. Uh, go with him or don't go. Go with him or don't go. You know. And now I'm, you know you're stuck because if you say no, then you know it's like you're saying no to God. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, exactly. Even though even though you know in our even though in our lifestyle we didn't you know for all practical purposes we had no we didn't revere God. Right. But in our heart, in our mind, we did. You knew. So just, we knew that was it was better. So that was better to do than not to do. You right. know? So at least that was it. So he uh, so I said, well, okay, and I'm sure the angels were just like. What is he going to say, you know? <laughs> Grace at that point was pouring down in abundance. So I actually, I said, yeah, let's, you know, I said, okay, we'll go. At least we'll be riding in style, you know, all the way half hour to 20 minutes to uh, Norfolk. Wow. So we went, you know, and probably, probably blaring Santana on the way, you know. Everything is going my way, as the song goes. <laughs> Everything is going my way. Um, so we went there, and um, basically when we entered the chapel, St. Matthew's Chapel there in Norfolk, the Adoration Chapel, Perpetual Adoration, which is, I, I, which I might add, is, um, is the, um, the source, as the Vatican documents say, the source, the center, and the summit of our Christian faith. Um, and that's where all, that's where vocations come from. It's, fr it's from adoration, yep. period. Um, and of course, our, our Blessed Lady is the one who draws us to the Eucharist. And she's the, that indispensable, um, you know, draw. Um, it was because it was through it was through praying of the Rosary, which our mother kind of forced us to do as ch kids, and through the Eucharistic Adoration that she used to be um, she used to you know um, you know participate in herself, is and that was the means that was the vehicle oh, sure. that got us to come back. So it was kind of like Don Bosco's dream, you know. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Don Bosco. He's the patron saint of, of youth. Um, he had this, this famous dream where he saw the church as a, as a big ship being um, kind of anchored between the two pillars. The one pillar was uh, one pillar was a little bit bigger than the other. The, the, that is the uh, the pillar having the, the the Eucharist at the top of it, and then the the smaller uh, pillar was um, had the the, uh, the Blessed Virgin on the top of that, and it was between those two pillars that the that the the boat the uh, the, the ship, the, the the church, was able anchored. to be anchored, you know, securely, even though it was being assailed from all sides. Right. So that, in a nutshell, you can kind of, if you want to paint a picture of our of our conversion, of our of our return to the faith, of our uh, the solidification of our, our faith, um, it was you can kind of kind of capture it in that image, you know. So um, uh, yeah, so. Between you know the, the, being educated in the, in the faith through praying the rosary and being you know being asked to go to the adoration chapel first by the example of my mother and through the instrumentality of my brother, um, I we there I was there uh, there I was in the adoration chapel basically waiting for my brother to to, to fulfill for that hour, fulfill right? that sixty minutes and let's go you know yeah. and um, yeah <laughs> and so what happened was. Um, I actually had the presence of mind. I, you know, again, it was Grace at work, and so he, he. I thought to myself, well, I mean, while I'm here, I might as well 
pray the rosary because you know nothing else to do. Nothing else to do, you know. So and we knew how to pray at least mechanically. Yeah. You know? So I did that like a robot, <laughs> and just knelt there and I prayed the first joyful mysteries. You know, we did we had the three mysteries that you know we now we have the four the luminous mysteries, but at the time there's only the three. Um, excuse me. And so I prayed the joyful mysteries, completed that. That in itself was a miracle. That was a, <laughs> that was a signal of grace. I mean. For our, you know, um, me praying the rosary on my own, you know, like completing it, that's a miracle. Um, and then going on, and then, and then I thought to myself, after I prayed the, after I completed the first mystery, set of mysteries, I thought to myself, well, the whole rosary consists of all three mysteries. Sure. So I, I went on to pray the sorrowful mysteries. And I still and have another 45 minutes. <laughs> yes, yeah. So it's got plenty of time, keep on going, you know. So I prayed, I, I completed the sorrowful mysteries, and then, uh, and last but not least, I, I finished the joyful mysteries. Glorious. I'm sorry, the, the glorious <laughs> mysteries. Thank you very much. Um, and so I, I prayed all three, and I completed all three, and I, I completed the full mystery, uh, the full rosary. Um, and so, and then from that night on, I never stopped going. Really? From that night on, I never stopped going with my mother. Wow. So. Um, I mean, I, I, it doesn't really surprise me. Yeah. I mean, it surprises me from where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. But I mean, once you start going to adoration, you yeah. really can't get enough of it. Yeah, it was typical. Yeah, well, it, it was. Yeah, it was. It, it, it was. It was that. So got, I had no idea. I had no idea what the real presence was. Right. I mean, we went to CCD class. We were educated in the faith. So I was in. I mean, as they say, as they, you know, we have an expression in English. You know, it goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah. And very often. That happens with kids who go to who get catechism. It's just, I mean, I remember the the the, 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 um, the pop, you know, in the, the soda pop in the in the cookies, but not much else, you know, <laughs> from CCD class, you know. I'm sure that I'm sure that you know the catechist did a great job. I just I don't think I was listening. <laughs> Nothing stuck. Nothing stuck, you know. Um, but so now you're going to adoration every day with your mom. Yeah, now I'm going to adoration every day, and um, I knew I just had to keep doing this. I had to keep doing it. And I just, I was like compelled, because, and that's very, uh, uh, by nature, that's how I am. I'm very passionate about whatever I do, I, I do it with a lot of passion, a lot of energy, and consistently. Um, it's just how I am. I just, right. whatever I put my mind to, like skateboarding, just, that's all I did. And my mother used to be, you know, she's like, why, you know, she didn't like it at all, because it, it was a loud, noisy, and... A little dangerous. Dangerous. <laughs> And very kind of, kind of a bit of a destructive and rebellious sport can be doesn't can have, be right doesn't have to be but it, very often there's a culture that's attached to skateboarding which is kind of rebellious, um, and so, but that's you know and being you know, um, I don't know if it, I don't know if all you know I mean I, you know the, okay the um, I was just told I had ten minutes oh that's, ter <laughs> that's terrible I need to hold, I need I need another forty five minutes, um, but yeah it was it was like. Um, I just I just knew that that's what I, keep, I, I had to keep doing, and um, what happened was I just that's what I did, and then I was just as it was as if I you know I, I didn't I couldn't care less even though I love my brothers I couldn't care less what what they did my my eldest brother was off with his band for I don't know if he continued that adoration I'm not sure how long that lasted for him. What my brother London was doing, I don't, I don't know. So now you're in your, you're in your I'm own just, world. I'm just like I've got I've got horse blinders on, and I'm just run I'm just galloping, you know, galloping away. And it was my eldest brother goes. It was as, it was he goes. It was as if they were you were dead. Wow. It was as if you were dead because I actually um, on my whole my whole schedule consisted of waking up, going to three masses a day with the with the um, Saint Gregory the Great Saint Gregory the Great Parish there in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Going to three masses, praying my stations of the cross after the three masses, biking to the the program, which I because I left high school, I enrolled myself in a in a program where I could expedite my education, and I got basically eleventh and twelfth grade finished in nine months. Got wow. my got my diploma, and um, and uh, and so I was so my whole schedule was like wake up, three masses, stations of the cross, bike to school. After school, um, um, I got a lift back with my mother, back to the house, kind of stayed in my room, prayed, read the Bible, um, and then went with her to adoration in the evening. And I knew, I see, I loved astronomy, I loved, um, you know, studying the stars and the, you know, the, orb, the orbit of the, the universe and stuff, stuff like that. But I knew, I had, I had quite a bit of money because I was still working, uh, I had a lot of money um, from my, my, pre, my job, but I'd work in the summertime down there at the, at the beachfront. And, but I, I was so tempted to buy a, a, like a large tel telescope, but I knew that I couldn't because once I get onto the roof and start stargazing, I knew <laughs> I would give everything else up. <laughs> I, I, would, I, would, I would say, no, 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 no. I, I, I'd be like, I can't go to adoration because I've got I to gotta follow this constellation or something, you know? <laughs> and I knew that would de to deter me from going to adoration, so I didn't buy the thing altogether. Um, 
And so I just, um, so that's what my, my, my schedule consisted of for a whole year. Wow. Uh, basically, I turned myself into a hermit. Right. And then I, I, I kind of, my, this Filipino friend, be, my, this Filipino guy befriended me. And um, I actually, I was a bit of a loner, a bit of a lone ranger, you know. At in this my, point. In my, <laughs> my own spiritual life. I actually didn't want any friends or any youth group participation. But he, he just like, he grabbed onto me and says, I want to be your friend, you know. And I was like, okay. So we went places of adoration and rosary together and mass and stuff like that. I did it for him more than for myself because mm -hmm. I didn't, I just wanted to be alone. But right. he, wanted, he was kind of clinging to me like, oh, I need you type of thing. Um, so to make a long story short, um, uh, my brother's just like, wait a minute, he's actually doing the right thing. He's actually doing what, you know, what, you know, mom, you know, mom was actually right. right. He's actually doing what mom wanted us to do. And so we all actually had kind of, um, we all kind of came back to the faith full on. Wow. But I couldn't have done it without my brother, Fridaticus. Right. He was an instrument. And actually, very interesting. Through the Cadillac. Yeah, with the, through the Cadillac, you know. You know, and it was just it's amazing. But he actually had a, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't make too much big deal of dreams, but he actually had a dream as a, as a young kid. We used to share our dreams, like, oh, I had a wonderful dream this morning, you know, last night. We used to share our dreams. And he told me one time, he goes, I had a dream. This is when I was like eight or nine. And, um, and he goes, I had a dream that the devil was after you. And he had a lot of horns, wow. you know, and he was ugly and you know, all this. And he goes, but he was trying to get you. And uh, he couldn't because I was standing between, wow. uh, between um, you and he. And he couldn't, get, he couldn't get to you because, of, because I was standing in the middle. And that's, that's, that's really Very what powerful, kind of happened. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, it was through him that I was able to come back, you know. He, you know and um, I mean, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's amazing the way God works. And, um, um, you know, life is um, it's either a comedy or a tragedy, yeah, right. you know. <laughs> um, so um, I kind of set aside. We, so actually, we actually came back to the church, started taking it seriously, going to Mass together, praying the rosary as a family, really. Wow. And then we all kind of realized we had a vocation. We all, all f my three brothers and I actually joined the FI. Really? We actually made a... We the made three a, of you? The three. Well, the f no, the, uh, f uh, the four of us. Four of you? The four of us. Uh, we all we actually made arrangements to stay with the friars in Libertyville, Illinois, the conventional wow. Franciscans, the black Franciscans. But then we kind of changed our we we um, changed our uh, plans to stay with them. We actually stayed with the FI in, in Massachusetts, um, the you know our present you mm -hmm. know our community that we're with now. And so we all joined. We were all postulants, aspirants together, and. Um, the, my two eldest brothers actually um, this, the discerned that it wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not happily married with eight kids each. Wow. And they, the, wow. The, the two younger ones stayed. So that that's basically awesome. That's basically the end of the story. We and we've been here ever since, for, since that we joined in '95. We've been here ever since, and we're just we're just you know uh, trying to be you know run the run the race. The St. Paul said, finish the, you know fight a good faith, fight a good fight, finish the race, and try and you know and be faithful to the to, the, to our callings. Now, um, I mean, this isn't the end of the story because you spent 10 years in Australia, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but <laughs> um, what kind of experience was, was that? Um, yeah, well, I've been stationed in Australia for the last... I, 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 um, in 2001, I was assigned by my superior, uh, Father Peter. He gave me a phone call there in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He says, um, he's got a very deep voice. He says, you know, said, Father Gabriel, you know, pack your bags, you're going to Australia. <laughs> I says, oh, okay, well, that'll be interesting, you know, so... <laughs> And so that's all it took, really. And I was, and I, on the way there, um, that was eight months before 9-11. And wow. so, um, you know, the Australian friars who came from Australia and stayed at the house, were assigned at the house that I was stationed at, they told me on the way here that they had asked to see the, the cockpit, you know? So it's just like, hmm, maybe I can do that. So on the way there, I, um, I rode Cathay Pacific on the way there. And I said, um, I said oh, I, I signaled to one of the stewardesses. I said, can I, um, can I see the cockpit? And she came back really quickly, and she said, "Come with me," you know. So I went up the went up the flight of stairs, and see, you know, it was Chinese airlines. I thought I was going to see a, two wow. Chinese pilots, and it was uh, one pilot was from the UK, you know, from Canada. I was, I was like, "What's going on here? Is it hijacked?" You know. And we had a little chat. Yeah, and that's stuff. really funny. Before nine eleven. Nine eight months before nine eleven, and I said to the pilots, "I said, if you ever find yourself in, in a bit of trouble." I was just like, this is amazing, because eight months later, did, did the incident happen, you know? Yeah. I said, if you ever find yourself in a bit of trouble, I said, pray to St. Joseph of Corpertino, who's the patron saint of aviators. He himself was a Franciscan, oh. conventual Franciscan. Um, and uh, I wonder if they thought about that afterwards, you know? Yeah. But, um, so I've been in Australia for the last um, 10 years. I'm still there. I'm still assigned there. I'm going back early next month. And um, 
So it's been very interesting um, seeing America from the point of from overseas. It's been very interesting. The Australians are lovely. I've been I've I've I, I owe my um, I owe so much to the Australians. Uh, it, would take, it would take forever to explain how and why. Um, but um, I've, I've learned so much there, and I've experienced so much joy and happiness there. And um, so, yeah, it's been interesting. Uh, there's a lot of pain, a lot of sorrow, just with any, any other vocation. Mm -hmm. um, married life, you know, the single life, the religious life, priest or sister or brother, uh, we all have our pain. Um, you know, in, in this life, as we, as we pray in the, in the Hail Holy Queen, as a valley of tears, but I just, you know, I pray that I can just maintain, be faithful, um, you know, be faithful to the end. Um, and I pray that my brothers will be faithful in their married state. Mm -hmm. And I pray that my brother and I, who are in religious life, will be faithful to our vocation. Because it's hard. Right, right. So, I mean, it's, it's not getting any easier. And I can honestly say, one guy asked me, he says, well, do you like what you're doing? Do you like your vocation? I said, like, yeah. But compared to our, the, the call that Christ was given by his father to fulfill his passion, it wasn't easy. Right. But he knew it was his father's will. And, um, and so he said, you know, um, um, you, know, um, you know, I love those words, you know, um, you know um, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and they know me. And I lay down my life for my sheep. It cost him his life. Yeah. And it wasn't easy. But, you know, no, you know, no, man, no one takes away my life. I lay it down freely. Right. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again this command I have received from my Father. And so we can say the same thing. We have power to receive the vocation. We have power to lay down our lives uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the sacrifices that God expects of us in our, any vocation. And, uh, and we also have power to raise it up again by our cooperation with the will of God and through the, um, and through the grace that is given to us by the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we're eternally grateful to, the, uh, to what we've been given. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I, unfortunately, we're out of time. So. Yeah, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed uh, Friar um, Gabriel's uh, uh, story, and uh, we hope to come back next time because we'll have to have him on again. And we hope when you look in the mirror next time, you realize yours too is the face of pro-life. Join us again next time.